Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so hopefully some of you will remember me from uh, the two webinars I delivered uh, last year on behalf of UCATA. Um, one of the reasons for delivering this additional webinar was the range of questions that were asked uh, limited time at the time of delivering the webinars. So myself and Craig and the board of directors of UCATA decided to offer ourselves for one final webinar to hopefully ask any further questions that um, uh, people viewing the webinars um, had and never had the opportunity to have their questions um, asked. So the two webinars we presented, Dimple just gave you a quick overview there. The part one was the first one, which was managing asbestos in buildings, uh, primarily looking at the duty holder. And of course, from the duty holder, we started to look at different strategies and what duty holders are required to do with regard to their asbestos management plans. We also touched on uh, who the duty holder was, trying to give some sort of a definition taken from uh, the guidance and the regulations um, and of course looking at the surveys and the different types of surveys. Um, in my opinion um, there's two aspects of managing asbestos. One is obviously managing the asbestos containing materials in buildings which obviously is a legislative legislat requirement. However the, the second phase of that was part two which I believe was delivered in August and that was to manage asbestos on site. Uh, quite technical in that sense because that's sort of aiming towards the project manager who is appointing the licensed contractor or in some cases the non-licensed contractor and given an understanding of what to expect when licensed works obviously is being undertaken. Now again that, that webinar opened up quite a few questions um, we are limited obviously on time with regard to those webinars and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as a training provider uh, we can talk about asbestos removal and asbestos management for several days in some cases. So this is obviously part three and uh, we've called it Ask the Expert. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, I've been in the industry um, over 20 years now dealing with uh, training courses ranging from basic asbestos awareness right through to uh, management courses and um, we get a full array of delegates from health and safety practitioners and some such as uh, yourselves, uh, facilities managers, right down to the uh, plumber, the carpenter, etc. So the principles of today is um, to ask any questions that you feel about um, the webinars I've delivered. I've also got Craig Evans, uh, who's the UK Chief Operating Officer, uh, sitting beside me. Um, so the, also the opportunity is to ask questions about UCATA and um, uh, the, regarding things like who are they, um, what they do. Uh, I've just done all this. So uh, UCATA, who are UCATA? I'm sure you've heard of UCATA, uh, the UK Asbestos Training Association. Um, 10, 11 years old now. Uh, what do UCATA do and how is UCATA formed? And of course, how they can demonstrate their members are competent to deliver uh, the range of courses. So to start us off, um, as mentioned earlier, we had uh, quite short time to deliver these uh, webinars. So this is a bit of a mop-up session really to uh, try to answer any additional questions that IOSH members or anybody uh, else has regarding the two subjects of duty to manage and of course the management of asbestos on site in addition to obviously UCATA. Now to start off um, we get regular questions asked by um, many many delegates on courses so what I've done here is I've put some sort of standard questions that we get regularly asked. I'll fly through these very quickly and then open the floor up uh, to Craig. Craig's going to go through a few standard questions and then everybody else can uh, fire their questions off. So first question we've got, we are a social housing provider and maintain rented domestic premises. Does the duty to manage apply? Um, it certainly does in the common parts. So let's, for example, a uh, social housing provider has uh, a block of flats. The individual domestic dwelling regulation for the duty to manage doesn't apply. However, obviously, it does apply to all the common parts, the staircases, uh, the bin chutes, the roof spaces, the services. Um, but of course, the domestic premises would be covered under another regulation, which is regulation five to uh, identify asbestos uh, prior to obviously carrying out demolition, maintenance and refurbishment. So it certainly does apply to uh, social housing providers. Uh, do we have to reinspect the ACMs every 12 months as there appears to be some confusion over the timescales? Um, this did raise a few concerns um, by the members of the, the last webinar because um, I was quite bold in my statement that um, uh, we do hear of people having to reinspect all of the ACMs every 12 months. I'm just going to refer to two paragraphs taken out of the ACOP L143. Um, the first one is paragraph 143 under regulation 4, which goes on to say the management plan, including records and drawings, should be reviewed every 12 months. But if we move on to paragraph 144, 
uh, any identified or suspected ACMs must be inspected and its condition assessed periodically. So it's not set down as a time scale. The previous ACOP L143 uh, from the 2006 regulations did actually state 12 months. So that was a slight change when they brought out the 2012 regulations. If you refer to the HSE's website um, and they have quite a good detailed information about the management and it runs from a series of steps through, um, that website uh, was actually updated uh, in 2008. So of course, well before the 2012 regulation. But what I will say is if you choose to inspect every 12 months, that's fantastic. Uh, there is a, a cost implication with that. But if you do have a premises where you have let's say some uh, bitumen um, pads under the sink or bitumen floor or floor tiles or adhesive. Um, the risks with those is obviously uh, very, very low, a lot lower than the AIBs and the laggings. So the frequency of the inspection uh, really does depend on type of activities in the building and of course uh, the risk. Uh, we've commissioned an asbestos surveyor to undertake re-inspections, but can I do these myself? You certainly can, uh, as long as you are considered competent to do so. And of course, there are a range of courses out there which will instruct you how to carry out the re-inspections. And that would obviously detail the material assessment and of course the priority assessment. The thing to remember here is the material assessment is undertaken by the surveyor, but the priority assessment is the duty holders or the appointed person's responsibility. So in essence, uh, you probably already doing part of that re-inspection anyway and the surveyor who provides the material um, inspection um, they are there's only two factors which will change with that that would be the condition and of course the surface treatment uh, a few more questions we often get asked is I've had an asbestos survey that is five years old do I need to have a new survey I think you've got to ask yourself the question how confident you are with the data of that survey um, I've I speak about this a lot to many many clients and in my opinion, one good survey, a management survey that is, um, should last for the period of the life of that building. You may require additional surveys if you're doing refurbishment and demolition works. However, um, the management survey um, should be sufficient for uh, quite a long time. But again, you do need to check the quality and the standard of that, uh, that survey. Uh, how can I check to see if the licensed contractor is competent to remove ACMs? Well, hopefully by definition, the fact that they hold a license issued by the health and safety executive hopefully will demonstrate that they are competent. Um, I suppose to move on from this question would be to ask how can I ensure that they actually have a license? Um, they might provide you with a copy of a license, but uh, that could be uh, two years old and it may have been revoked by the health and safety executive. So the best source for that is um, a quick Google onto uh, the website to Google HSE licensed asbestos contractors. It will take you to the web communities and the web communities is a, a source of information. Um, a lot of uh, consultants uh, post um, various different things for uh, people to learn on, but there is a list of the licensed contractors and it will show you their uh, issue, uh, sorry, their expiry date and their license number. So you can actually reference that. That would be the most up-to-date uh, list for current licensed contractors. Uh, should I employ the asbestos analysts um, or shall I leave this to the contractor? Um, I'm going to be very impartial here. My opinion of this is, and I think it is the same with the HSC, is that the client really should be employing the analyst um, as uh, an independent. However, if you're not aware of any analysts, then you can source those on uh, the UCAS website. Um, or if um, you don't want to get involved in booking the analyst, uh, nominate um, your own analysts and let the contractor obviously organize this for you. At least you are having that say and uh, you have that independence uh, with regard to that. A um, couple more for me. Uh, can my own staff undertake non licensed works? If so, what training do they need? They certainly can undertake non licensed works on the proviso that they are suitably trained. The minimum training they would require would be sometimes referred to as the category B, um, but the correct term is for non licensable works training. Uh, under UCATA rules, it's a, a day and a half in duration. Break that down into three phases. The first phase, half day, would be a UCATA asbestos awareness um, within the last six months. The second phase of that would be the theory taken from the health and safety uh, guidance HST 210, the asbestos essentials. And then the third part of that sort of day and a half would be the practical. So although it appears to be a day and a half, it could actually be covered in um, one day on the proviso that the delegates have their asbestos awareness in the past six months. Uh, I've been told that face fit testing is only required for asbestos works. Is that correct? 
also what types of face fit testing are available so two parts to this question um, face fit testing is required for all tight fitting face pieces so that would be half mask reusable respirators or full face um, power assisted or non-power assisted respirators basically if there's a seal uh, for, between the respirator and the face then a face fit test is required there is two types of face fit testing the first is the qualitative which checks the quality um, of the seal that is done by using a taste test um, qualitative face fit testing kits are available and a lot of uh, my clients will actually do their own face fit testing using the qualitative face fit test kit if it's a full face respirator then it has to be quantitative now to have quantitative face fit testing you would actually require a machine um, a port account machine obviously to uh, carry that uh, face fit testing out and does the surveyor need to be UCAS accredited? Um, the legislation doesn't state that they have to be accredited. They have to be competent. Um, and it's always advisable you do your due diligence on the uh, surveyor. Uh, UCAS accreditation does give some, uh, um, some assistance in the sense that you've got recourse if you're not happy with the surveyor. And of course, they do have standards, quality standards and technical standards, which they do follow. Um, but it, it's not a legal requirement to use UCAS accredited, but it is uh, strongly recommended. Uh, by the HSE. So they're my questions that uh, I've commonly get asked. So I'm going to pass you over to Craig Evans, the Chief Operating Officer now, who has um, some standard questions that Craig obviously will be uh, uh, happy to help you with. Thank you, Graham. So looking at the, um, the, the, the first question, um, why choose a UCAT training provider? So I think first of all, it's, it's a good idea to go back to who UCAT who is. So we're, not, we're a not-for-profit training association. Um, like Graham said, we've been established for, for over 10 years now. Um, we've got the largest online directory of asbestos training providers who are all independently audited. So um, that's just a bit of an overview of, of the association. Um, we're actually governed by a board of 11 volunteer directors. Um, so in terms of why choose a UCAT training provider, um, I've already mentioned they're independently audited um, to extremely high standards. Um, all training materials are verified. Um, it's an ongoing process. Um, it's not a case of memberships given um, and they keep that membership. It's a case of maintaining that membership. It's an ongoing process. Um, all UCAT training um, delivered by members is CPD accredited. Um, and also all members are pre-approved on the CITB um, approved training organization scheme, um, meaning that all of the training courses delivered by our members would be um, eligible for, for grant um, reclaim for levy payers. Um, in addition to that, all UCAR certificates are traceable as well, um, produced by members, traceable on our website 24 seven. Um, so you've got some reassurance there that you can check the validity of certificates. Um, and also um, just to reassure, um, you know, listens of the webinar that there is a strict rules of membership as well that our members have to comply with in terms of audit verification and due to competency. Um, so again, you can be sure, you know, you can be assured that the training is being delivered to, to the highest possible um, competency. So next question, um, how do I apply to become a member of UCARTA? Um, the application process um, is all outlined on our, on our website. Um, but in a nutshell, the process is that every, every um, company must have an employed tutor um, and there's a, there's a tutor criteria. Um, again, that's available on our website, but an overview, um, particularly for say asbestos awareness, would be three years industry or health and safety experience within the last five years. Um, an asbestos qualification, so something along the lines of a, an unlicensed course, a licensed course, or a duty to manage a point of person course. Um, they are also required to undertake a tutor knowledge test, um, and they are also required to have um, provide evidence that they've delivered that training in the past. Um, the process for membership is um, verification, so members would submit their training materials for verification. Um, again, they're assessed by an independent verifier. Um, once those materials have been accepted, um, the member would then proceed to the audit stage. Again, an independent auditor would go out and assess that member, assess the tutor delivering the course. Um, and then that's referred back to the office for a decision on membership. So just to point out, the auditor does not make a decision on membership. It's actually made by the UCARTA office. Um, and again, once that's been accepted, they're approved as a member, and then they're listed on the UCARTA online training provider directory, and they get access to our certificate generator, meaning they can produce a UCATA certificate. Um, in addition to that, there is a requirement as well for tutors um, 
to take the tutor knowledge test on a three year cycle and also maintain CPD points as well. Um, do I need a dedicated training centre to be able to apply? For awareness level, there's no requirement for a dedicated training centre, um, but for the non-licensable level and licensable um, level of training, there is a requirement um, to have dedicated training premises. They don't have to be um, owned, they can be a leased premise, um, but before that's published on the UCATA website, it will undergo an audit. So it's a case of making sure there's adequate space, equipment, etc., on site to ensure that that training can be delivered. Um, this is a question we get asked quite a lot, actually. How do I become an approved, uh, sorry, approved to deliver asbestos awareness e-learning only? So asbestos awareness e-learning is not a category of membership. Um, so there is no application for e-learning unless you're a member. So as it's a delivery method, um, it's actually an additional course. So you would have to be a member at one of the categories of training first. So awareness, non-licensed or licensable um, before you could apply for e-learning. And the reason for that is to demonstrate competency in a classroom level um, prior to you know, delivering the course online. Um, again, another question we get asked quite a lot is um, why do certificates only last for 12 months? <clears throat> so before um, the change in the regulations in 2012, it was an annual requirement for um, training to be, to be refreshed. Um, with the recent change, um, there is still a requirement for licensable and non-licensable um, training to be refreshed um, at least every year. Um, with asbestos awareness, there is no requirement to refresh on an annual basis, but some form of refresher training should be given as necessary. So you can't define as necessary to be every 12 months. Um, the HSE guidance and regulations set out the minimum um, criteria, minimum guidance, um, and we aim to, to go above that minimum guidance. So how long does membership um, last for you, Carter? So, Membership lasts for a period of 12 months. So it is a requirement that membership is renewed um, on an annual basis. And again, they go through the process of um, verification of materials, um, auditing of, of trainers, um, that type of thing. So it is a 12 month annual membership. Um, so another question, I want to become a member and I'm currently delivering non-licensed and asbestos awareness training, but I am wanting to only join at asbestos awareness level. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have strict um, rules of membership. Um, and if you, you have to join UCARTA at the highest level of training that you deliver. So if you were delivering non-licensed training, you would have to apply at that category. Similarly with licensed training, you couldn't just apply for asbestos awareness training. Um, you would have to apply at the highest level of training that, that you deliver. If I gain membership, can I use another company to advertise UCARTA courses for me? Um, yeah, absolutely, um, that is um, a possibility. Again, referring back to our rules of membership, there is a requirement um, for, that, for those companies to be registered. So we refer to them as third party agents, whether that's a reselling agent or a, um, an advertising agent. Um, yeah, there is a requirement to have those registered um, and within our brand guidelines, there's a stock statement that they must publish it, you know, on their website to say that they are not a member of UCARTA, but they are delivering it through an agreement with the UCARTA member. And the final question I've got on here is what other courses do UCARTA offer? So we will go into this um, in a bit more detail uh, towards the end of the, um, the presentation, but a quick overview of the courses that we deliver um, and our members deliver is asbestos awareness. So there are some specialist um, courses for that. There's asbestos awareness for ground workers as well. And there's more recently asbestos awareness for waste management and civic community site operatives and managers. Um, similarly, we offer non-licensed training, um, so we've got the non-licensable for operatives, um, we've got non-licensable for ground workers, and again, the non-licensable for waste management and civic community site operatives and managers. We've got a whole host of um, licensable courses, so we've got new operative, new supervisor, new manager, um, all the subsequent refreshers of that as well. Um, we've got ancillary license holders courses, scaffold managers courses, um, operatives and, and supervisors. Um, there's asbestos enclosure entry, there's a whole host and again they're listed on our website. 
Um, just in terms of the management courses, um, we do offer the duty to manage, which Graham's covered, um, and the duty to manage for the appointed person, again, which we'll explain in more detail. Um, again, recently, we've just um, launched the duty to manage for the housing sector, which is obviously specific to that sector. Um, we do have an RPE competent persons course. And again, recently, we've released um, asbestos project managers. Um, and I have seen a question pop up again, which we'll come on to, um, just in relation to, um, to ground, asbestos in soils. So we do have asbestos in soils awareness and um, also a, a, a much larger course um, titled asbestos in soils. And again, we'll come on to those courses in a bit more detail. Um, like I said, one of the questions have been asked, so we'll come on to that. Okay. Thank you, Craig. Um, so if we open up the uh, uh, screen, uh, we should hopefully see uh, several questions, obviously, that uh, some of you have been posting. So we'll try to uh, answer these. They may be directed at me. I'm not sure. I can't see the questions. But uh, Craig's going to read the questions out so everybody's uh, familiar with, obviously, what uh, questions are being asked. Yeah, so um, the first question that we've had is um, what level of competence or any helpful advice would you suggest for persons involved in groundwork investigations regarding identification of asbestos in soils? Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's take this, break this down. So involved in ground investigations, um, there is a minimum requirement under Regulation 10 that any person is likely to come into contact with asbestos as a minimum would require an asbestos awareness um, training course. Now, I've done quite a few of these where we have um, land surveyors and geologists who are actually taking samples of the ground. And again, there's some future guidance due out um, regarding this from the HSE under uh, the analyst guide. But um, if they are taking samples of asbestos, they would require as minimum uh, a sort of non-licensed asbestos course because obviously they will be disturbing asbestos. So in theory, if obviously it's a case of just potentially coming across this stop and work and passing back, that would then be a minimum of asbestos awareness training. If obviously the uh, soil samples are known to contain asbestos or likely to contain asbestos by way of risk assessment or um, previous uh, data knowledge of the, uh, the use of the site, then there's a good chance asbestos will be disturbed and there's a minimum it's, uh, it's non-licensable. So for example, if we break the three categories down, asbestos awareness, uh, that's to identify no working with it non-licensable does include analysts does include surveyors and does include people taking samples and then of course the licensable training obviously for people uh, dealing with the lagging the insulation and the asbestos insulation board thank you graham um so another question that we've had um i am an electrical data installation company and not only working with acm container materials we are all asbestos awareness trained However, is there any further training for managers of employees and contractors and some that have already undertaken CAT-B training, which is a non-licensable training? Also, information on reading and understanding asbestos registers and or management plans and information contained in the two types of surveys. It's a bit of a mouthful, but... That's all right. Okay, uh, I'm going to break this down again. So, um, regarding the asbestos awareness training, um, one of the um, parts of the asbestos awareness training is certainly in the syllabi of UCATA. It clearly states is how to... Um, avoid coming into contact with asbestos. So as part of that course, one of the discussions that we, we, we do on our asbestos awareness courses and UCATA members should be doing the same is to explain the different types of um, surveys and of course make reference to the register. For me, as a training provider, I carry uh, an asbestos um, register uh, from my, my own uh, premises. Um, and of course we show that register and how to understand it. They are very different all registers then there's no standard uh, asbestos register or no standard asbestos survey that uh, people can access they're, they're, they're all done by different companies and there's a slightly different layout first point of contact really is to have a look at the drawing to see where you're actually working to see if it identifies any asbestos um, the other part about the training for managers of employees and contractors uh, undertaking the cat b training course um, we are currently in the development i think it has been released yet has it the um, the one that John's doing for managers. 
it's not been released yet but yeah it's in the final stages of preparation yeah okay so there's a there's a new course uh, which is a bolt on obviously to the the cat b training or the non licensable training which will be aimed at managers and supervisors it's very close i think it's with one of the directors just to finalize um so i would envisage we we have a board meeting on monday and that would probably be ratified and released uh, in the next coming weeks uh, and that would be aimed at how you um, develop a plan of work how you can maintain um, the plant and the RPE PPE so it gives you an overview of to sort of manage the people undertaking that type of work activity so if you keep a abreast of UCATA's website um, you'll be able to see that uh, hopefully being released uh, very very soon okay thank you Graham um, Another question, um, if asbestos is known to be in a tenant's home, what is the duty holder's responsibility? If asbestos is known to be in a tenant's home, what is the duty holder's responsibility? Okay, under the regulation four, the duty to manage obviously doesn't apply uh, because it is a uh, domestic premises. So in theory, there is no, no reinspection. However, there is requirements obviously under uh, regulation five to identify asbestos. So obviously that's known so any maintenance works is being carried out demolition works etc um, but certainly under the defective premises act there is a requirement that um, any uh, any potential defect within a property which could cause harm or uh, disease uh, that could obviously uh, include asbestos then of course that puts a requirement onto landlords to rectify that defect now I think uh, under the uh, sort of common law duty, you would have a responsibility to inform uh, the tenants, obviously the, the location and whereabouts of asbestos, but it does have a very negative impact because tenants obviously are not aware of um, the true dangers of asbestos. And of course they can be quite concerned. Um, so my, my personal point of view is I think you, we should have an obligation to inform um, the tenants of asbestos, but inform them in a way that obviously it's not going to scaremonger and uh, more importantly, inform them their responsibilities as a tenant that they shouldn't be disturbing any fabric of the building without the landlord's express permission. And that's pretty much standard in most uh, landlord and tenant um, uh, agreements but uh, it is a difficult one because uh, they are often considered to be the lay person and uh, possibly don't know as much about the subject of asbestos as other people and of course again there is the theory that if it's asbestos then of course it's going to harm them but it's not necessarily it's just a case of monitoring it managing it and making sure it doesn't become uh, um, releasing fibers thanks graham um another one um we had an asbestos survey three years ago, which identified several areas of ACMs which were labelled. My engineering manager carries out visual, uh, visual checks each month to ensure they've not been disturbed. What course, of, uh, what course should, we, should he have, if any, for visual checks? Okay, um, so some sort of training in looking at um, the various different uh, uh, issues that can occur with and damage occurred obviously with asbestos the definition of um, if it's disturbed or the damage of it will be somewhat subjective because it is a form of a risk assessment but as a minimum uh, the duty to manage one day overview will give you a, an indication of what reinspections um, are uh, what, what's involved in reinspections if you want to go into more detail then there's the duty to manage appointed persons course which obviously that goes into how you carry out the uh, material and priority assessment um, with regard to the monthly checks that's very very good that the manager is doing that um, maybe obviously down to risk that there is a, a high potential that they could become disturbed um, so uh, but keep a record of that make sure obviously that's uh, that's maintained but um, certainly for the garden visual checks it's a risk assessment and I'm sure I don't need to tell IOSH members about risk assessments and the fact is it is subjective but um, we have a scoring system in the industry um, it's the material assessment uh, score you if you want to find information about that if you refer to HSG 264 uh, within that document there is a table and what your manager would be looking at is four factors so the product type the extent of damage or condition surface treatment and of course the asbestos type the first two asbestos uh, type and the product they're always going to be common they're not going to change over time the condition could change and certainly the surface treatment can change so have a look at those two aspects has the condition changed has the surface treatment changed and make reference obviously to the photos from the survey to obviously give you a comparison to see whether there has been any deterioration um, going forward thanks again graham um 
Another question here, um, there is always a lot of caveats on asbestos reports. Um, a lot of the time this prevents work going ahead on site. How can this be reduced even after briefing the surveyor? This will still occur, i.e. not checking in pipe boxing or boilers when working in plant rooms. Okay, this is uh, a very, very common question um, and I'm sure uh, the individual who write this question has probably got a survey with no accessed areas. Um, this does frustrate me somewhat. We've got to go back a little bit and understand why we are doing these surveys and that will take you back to the mid-1990s when it was identified that the maintenance personnel uh, were at risk of becoming exposed to asbestos. What we really need to instill in the surveyors is that they put themselves in the maintenance uh, person's position and go into these boxing areas and go into these um, plant rooms obviously they don't want to be disturbing asbestos while they're doing that but remember they are competent they are suitably trained they should be wearing rpe and they should be wearing ppe but any areas where the maintenance personnel to remove a pipe box in um, is going to undertake then in my opinion the surveyor should also be undertaking that now you mentioned there obviously the briefing with the surveyor. Uh, one thing I will refer to you is table four in HSG 264. It's a table that's been around for a lot of years. It was in the old MDHS 100 document back in 2001 and it clearly states what is involved in a management survey and that does include uh, above false ceilings, riser ducts, underfloor service ducts, um, and it does go on to finalise to say this list is not exhaustive. Now, if you're having a survey under, in, a, in accordance with HSG 264, please refer them to chapter uh, to um, table four within HSG 264, um, and that would be obviously the minimum as a management survey. Um, do come across a lot of surveyors would look at a boxing and say, and that's intrusive. Uh, management surveys are intrusive um, they're not destructive but they should be intrusive and they should go wherever maintenance personnel is so try to eliminate those no accessed areas and um, brief the surveyor but more importantly request a survey brief uh, from the surveyor of what they are going to do and what they're not going to do and then of course if there's areas which uh, are not necessarily safe for the surveyor then of course you've got the option to provide additional facilities such as electricians, um, maintenance personnel to assist the surveyor to provide them with that access. So work with the surveyor um, and communicate and make sure obviously you're getting the survey and you're getting good value for money as well. Thanks Graham. Um, you have to bear with me on this one, this is quite a large question. So um, if I have appointed a licensed contractor to complete non-license removal and the plan of works risk assessment and method statement is substandard, i.e. very generic, not applicable to works at all, in brackets removing floor tiles, yet the method statement refers to enclosures, airlocks, four stage clearance, also no mention of preparing the works area. Also after tiles are removed, no mention of personal decontamination or decontaminating tools, etc. Again, risk assessment, not relevant to the task, refers to mobile scaffold. Um, for floor tile on ground, remove, uh, ground floor, contractors stating they are licensed and as such their general method statements, risk assessments have been checked by HSE and being um, generic is fine. My issue is, as a public sector client, I need to be sure removal will be completed correctly. What should I do if I have concerns? What expertise training should they have? Appear to have asbestos removal site supervisor and removal operative training. Should they have done anything more? E.g. a 405, 406. This is very, very common. Um, <laughs> The way I would pick, picture this is that if that licensed contractor was doing a licensable work activity, they would not use generic plans of work. They would have to have a job and site specific assessment and plan of work in accordance with Regulation 6 and Regulation 7. Now, one of the documents um, some contractors do refer to is HSG 210, which are task sheets. They are not method statements. And of course, they're not job and site specific. So the contractor could utilize the task manuals. So for example, floor tiles, it would be A23. And um, they could utilize that as their sort of task sheet on how to undertake the work, but they must still carry out a suitable assessment of the actual site itself. Uh, and that is a legal requirement. Uh, regarding um, the comment there, let me just try to find it. Our license as such said general method statements, risk assessments have been checked by the HSE and being generic is fine. 
I find that very hard to believe. Um, the HSC, uh, there's no such thing as a generic method statement. They have to be job and site specific. Um, the HSC, uh, when they conduct their renewals and their interviews, they very rarely look at the non-licensable works because it's a license that they are applying for and renewing. So they will concentrate more so on the license. Um, I think in this case, you need to go back to your contractor and request a job and site specific assessment and plan of work. So sorry, just on that, with regard to should they have any more training, um, they are trained probably at the highest level. Um, and it's just a very quick way of just generating a, a plan of work, which um, they should be more than competent to be able to put together a, a job and site specific assessment. So they don't need 405s and 406s. They've got um, quite a lot of training. It's just a very quick way of turning a job around. But again, same opinion, if it was a license, if it was the floor tiles became licensable, would they then use a generic? And the answer would be no. So put them in the same position as if they're doing license works when undertaking non-license works. Thank you. Um, another question, are there any asbestos products being manufactured recently? And if so, will they be meeting the license requirements and as per regulations? Uh, in this country, no. Um, obviously, 1999, we banned the imported use and raw use of asbestos. So um, post 2000, no asbestos uh, products have been manufactured. However, um, I can't speak for China. I can't speak for other countries around the world who are still using asbestos. There have been some recent cases, and I'm sure you can find this on the HSE's website, where a couple of companies were importing some um, gauzes for um, the Bunsen burner tripods and they were tested to uh, to contain asbestos. There was also another case recently um, some gaskets were manufactured in 2006 to 2012 I think it was don't quote me on that maybe 2010 um, and they were tested and they were also contain, contained to, uh, found to contain asbestos. Most of the products that we do come across past or post 2000 do tend to have been imported and maybe bypassed the system of checking etc uh, to determine the first asbestos but certainly in this country uh, no manufactured products outside yes lots of asbestos products are still being manufactured just following on from um, that question from the same person, um, one of the warehouses in the project site has asbestos roof installed nearly 25 years ago. Recently parts of the roof started deteriorating. How can the roof be maintained? Is it only through the total replacement or if not, are there any asbestos fittings available for taking up partial replacement? Yeah, there certainly are. So we're talking about corrugated roof sheets, asbestos cement. Um, so we can now purchase fibre cement, which is to the same size. So you've got the same profile for the roof sheets. Um, they are non-asbestos. They will have markers on them. Sometimes they're indented on the sheets on the underside. Sometimes they're inked on and they will have the initials NT. NT would stand for new technology. So it's the same principal technology as manufacturing asbestos uh, cement roof sheets, but they don't contain asbestos and they haven't done for so for many years. So, and that's the same, not just for um, roof sheets, you can do the same for things like um, uh, downpipe rep replacements or gutter replacements. And of course, if you, you've only got small areas, then sometimes the, the, the fiber cement sheets can be installed. Um, but again, you've got to bear in mind the person installing them will be removing um, asbestos cement so as a minimum non-licensable works training would have to be undertaken. Thanks Graham. Um, another question here, will surveys for houses ever become law? Asbestos is getting older, will that, call, will that start causing problems? Um, I don't think it will ever become law and uh, they did trial this many years ago when they started to uh, look at bringing the home condition reports in. Um, that fell by the wayside and um, that would have been a great opportunity for the home condition surveyors to identify asbestos in uh, domestic properties. Um, the thing to bear in mind is that if a, an, a domestic or a homeowner occupier employs a contractor to carry out works within their property, these regulations will apply to that contractor who is actually an employer. Therefore, they should undertake an assessment in accordance with Regulation 5 or where there is no assessment, they should at least as a minimum make a presumption that um, there is asbestos within those properties, but I can't see it ever becoming law. Thanks, Graham. Um, asbestos dangers next. Um, during and after fires in buildings, what would be the course of actions? How to plan and be ready? 
Um, problem with fires in the buildings is the asbestos will deteriorate. Um, it has great properties regarding fire protection, but um, it will only sustain so much. So, of course, the problem being is um, some of the products or most of the products will become very fibrous. And, of course, as such, a potential to release fibers would obviously be um, very, very high. Um, if after a fire, you do need to be very mindful of entering a fire damaged building. A fire brigade will go in, put the fire out, but they may damage certain fabrics of the building. But bear in mind when they are. Are, um, inspecting they are trained they are um, suited and booted they've got their RP their, their, um, their BA systems on so if you are entering to inspect a building after a fire carry out a risk assessment if you carry out your risk assessment you're not aware of all the hazards so a general sort of rule of thumb is err on the side of caution and maybe look to um, where the suitable PPE and RPE obviously to enter from that it's going to require some form of inspection by a surveyor from that then of course it will lead on to most possibly being removed by specialist license contractors thanks Graham um, if a survey was a type two in 2002, should this be resurveyed under the management or R&D type? Simple answer to that, no. Um, if the type two survey that was undertaken, bear in mind that was uh, a lot of years ago, that was under the old MDHS 100. Um, if the survey was undertaken in accordance with MDHS 100, it should be more than sufficient. I mentioned earlier in a previous question, table four taken out of HHT 264. That same paragraph in table four was actually used in um, MDHS 100 as defining the areas that should be inspected under a type one and type two survey, type one being presumptive, type two being a sampling, and then the type three obviously being the uh, major refer pre-demolition under the old regime. So no, if you're happy with the data and uh, all areas have been inspected, the type two survey has been replaced by the management survey. That's pretty much all that, uh, all that happens. So um, it's all about confidence in that, in that original survey. Thank you. Risk assessments on asbestos should only be carried out by qualified risk assessors on asbestos management. If so, what should be the minimum qualification for such assessors or surveyors? Okay, so again, as mentioned, um, the duty holder would be responsible for carrying out what's called the priority assessment because they understand the use of the building, how many people occupy the area, and more importantly, the maintenance activities. If we're referring to the... Um, material assessment there's four factors so the product condition surface treatment and asbestos type the top the first two the first and the last the asbestos type and the product they're they're going to be common so the middle two which would be the condition and surface treatment they're the only two that would require any or are likely to change in any way shape or form um, it is advisable to have some sort of qualification. You do need to be competent and of course we all know the definition of competency but certainly um, the recommendation there would be a minimum of a one day overview, but that is only an overview or the uh, appointed persons course, which obviously then you can uh, go into it in a lot more detail as part of that course. It's carrying out those risk assessments and discussing the results of those risk assessments along with the priority assessments. Uh, the other alternative uh, would be to outsource that to a surveyor to come and do the reinspections and do the reassessments. Um, but of course, there again, there's a, there's a fee, there's a charge and a cost there um, for, for the surveyor to attend to undertake that. Thanks, Graham. Um, next question. A licensed contractor has been contracted um, to drill holes in ACM known areas. What documentation or information should they issue after works have been completed? On their RAMs, it states their supervisor will conduct a visual inspection. I do not believe this is sufficient for us to go back into the area and complete works. Okay. Um, there's two parts of this question, really. Um, if we're drilling holes, what are they drilling through? So if, for example, you are using a licensed contractor and they are drilling holes through, let's say, um, asbestos insulation board, which is uh, generally in most cases a license of work activity, although it can be done under uh, short duration works, um, then if it exceeds that short duration time scale, it would be actually a, a license of a work activity, no enclosure, no necessary for enclosure and airlocks, uh, but maybe some sort of reassurance air monitoring uh, might be suitable to um, ensure obviously that the area has been cleaned properly. Um, if it was a non license of work activity, again, in most cases, there's no legal or in most cases, no necessary requirement to carry out um, any uh, reassurance air monitoring and a supervisor carrying out a visual inspection should be uh, should be suitable 
obviously as a client if you feel that you want more than that then again you could uh, outsource that to uh, an analyst an analyst employed by yourself as a client as independent they will gladly come in and do a visual for you uh, and obviously do a reassurance air test at the same time remembering obviously asbestos in the air is the is the concern and it's all about trying to prevent people's uh, people's exposure but again supervisors should be more than competent they are trained to carry out vision inspections as they are now for um, live uh, or in enclosed works before the analyst actually arrives so um, it should be sufficient but if you're not happy with that then by all means uh, employ an analyst to undertake a, uh, uh, a an air test or a visual thank you graham um another question um what is the current status of asbestos related diseases notified is there any reduction from the previous years um how is the awareness being circulated to residents to reduce exposure to asbestos so um, I can certainly say the, the, the figures for asbestos related diseases are not increasing at the minute. Uh, sorry, are not decreasing at the minute. Um, they are on the increase. Um, there's currently the HSE report over 5,000 deaths um, per year due to asbestos related diseases. Um, the actual figure when you look at the statistics is, is actually over 5,500. So um, it's a lot more. Um, several years ago, it was around 4,500. Um, so yeah, it is on the increase. Um, and then just in terms of what, uh, you know, how is awareness being spread? Well, that's one of the um you know one of the things that we do is, is you carter and you know other trade associations as well um we are spreading the message out there you know as far as as far and wide as we can so um we do a lot in terms of social media um to to try and um, get to those people and you know explain the um the disease the related diseases um and we do a lot through um, our website, attending events, speaking at conferences. Um, so yeah, we are doing a lot and we do work with um, other associations as well to, to try and um, increase awareness of, of, of asbestos related diseases. So yeah, unfortunately it's not great news that it's on the increase, but um, that's where we're at at the, at the minute. Can I just add to that as well? An interesting one is that it's expected to peak around about 2025. Uh, and then the hope is that the, the death rates will start to decrease. Um, and that's all based on um, mapping that the agency have done based on the uh, imports that were undertaken in 1975. They started to increase. And as of course, the imports increased um, 50 years on, of course, the death rates start to increase. So fingers crossed, we're waiting obviously for 2025, 26, 27, hopefully for the, the, the death rates obviously to decrease. Um, just from a personal point of view, um, last year I was, in, uh, I had to, I'd done a bit of research into some old um, presentations that I was delivering back in 2001, 2002. And on the presentations I was delivering in 2002, we're actually stating back then that the, the death rates would actually peak in 2012. We are now in 2019 and unfortunately uh, they never peak. They continue to increase, of course. And as such, um, the hope is that they will start to treat. There is a lot more awareness and there is a lot more obviously um, legislation and enforcement by the HSE and um, enforcement officers to um, obviously prevent people from um, uh, becoming exposed to asbestos and then of course the, um, the ramifications of getting it wrong um, are very very grave um, very expensive and of course uh, prosecutions by the health and safety executive do deter people from obviously doing uh, things incorrectly but uh, yeah it's interesting figures there from 2000, what I'll be saying in 2025 <coughs> if I'm still training I don't know we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Thanks, Graham. Um, just before we go on to um, a couple more questions, we are just going to launch a, um, a poll. If you could all just um, take part in that poll, please. That should be with you now. Um, so next question, um, if you discover AIB in demolition rubble during groundworks, would its removal be classed as licensed work? Yes, simple answer. Uh, it's AIB. The condition of the AIB is going to be poor, um, so there would be no exemptions for that. Um, the thing you've got to bear in mind is whether the rubble is totally cross-contaminated, and if such, then the rubble and the AIB would have to be defined as hazardous waste and disposed of. But AIB, poor condition, it's always going to be a licensed contractor because of the risk associated with it. 
Thank you. Um, last question we've got on here. Um, I was at a meeting last night. It was um, a specialist health and safety lawyer. It surprised me that in a lot of cases they were dealing with, no one has ever read the asbestos survey. Essentially, everyone expected the other person to read and understand it. Her comment was, what's the point in them if they are not read and understood? As well as the survey report, then the client and the surveyor must work together, talk together. Um, is this enshrined within regs or within UCATA training? Uh, certainly within um, regs, it very clearly um, states that the duty holder uh, must obviously make sure people are aware of the locations and whereabouts of asbestos. It does also go on to say um, that it needs to be understood. Um, we see too, far too many times um, contractors are asked to sign to say they've read and understood it. They're busy people. They want to get on with the work. Um, signing uh, just to say they've read it invariably as per your question, um, they probably haven't read it. They just want to get on with the work activity. And of course, this is where obviously problems can occur and uh, exposures can also occur. So it is the duty holder's responsibility to ensure not just read and under, uh, not just read it and signed it. They do actually understand it and understood it. So I've got a lot of clients that won't just ask for a signature. What they will do is they will carry out an induction, a toolbox talk, and explain obviously that this is the register, this is the survey. Make sure you understand it. One one way to test that people have understood it is ask them to read it and then take the survey and away from them and ask them where the asbestos is in their working area because they then should know that uh, it's on the ceiling, it's on the walls or it's on the floor. Um, is it enshrined within regs? Yes. Is it built within UCATA training? Um, I certainly do include it within my training to encourage people to make sure they check. Um, UCATA developed a pre-work assessment a number of years ago um, i believe it's on the website with the emergency procedures it is, yeah. um, please go on and download it the pre-work assessment says before you start work ask to see a copy of the register and if the register is not available and then it just goes around in a circle until an inspection of the area has been under um, been, been carried out then once that's undertaken the duty holder should then uh, confirm that people have actually understood the information Thank you. I'll just do this last one just before we um, move on to the, the next part of the presentation, just the final bit. Um, so should surveys be read in conjunction with the management plan and do duty holder responsibility to give access to the plan just like the register? Well, the management plan will include the register. Um, it will also include a communication plan and it will also include an action plan. And the idea of the action plan is to determine what needs to be undertaken, whether it be a 12 month inspection, etc. The register is obviously the um, document which shows the locations of all the asbestos containing materials sometimes linked up with the action plan the problem is with surveys the, well, the positives of surveys is that they show all the photographs and it shows the original uh, condition of the asbestos containing material the problem with surveys is that they could be out of date within a period of months because as soon as the survey has been undertaken there may be some asbestos has been removed and then of course the survey won't it will still show that product so the register does need to be read in a conjunction with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the the register needs to be read in conjunction with the survey as a reference point because the register will be live in in such that that is what's left the survey may be well out of date within a few months thank you very much um so if we just move on to one of the latter slides Okay, so there was a number of questions there. And again, this is just to uh, conclude and of course where we were uh, on our previous webinars. Um, the questions were about the um, what training is available. So uh, UCATA management training for duty holders and appointed persons. We have two uh, two courses available. The first on the right of your screen is the one day overview of the duty to manage. So this is uh, aimed at those assisting duty holders and appointed persons uh, to provide the delegate with a basic understanding of the uh, duty to manage, a quick overview of the survey. That would also include obviously how to access the survey, how to read the survey, and um, the, the, the idea of the management plan and its requirement. Um, it will also cover very, very quickly the risk assessments of the asbestos containing materials. For more information than that, and to undertake the risk assessments in a competent manner, then of course there is the duty to manage appointed persons. That's a three day course that goes into quite a lot of detail. Um, it's very positive feedback from that, uh, that course. And of course it's specific obviously for the duty to manage um, 
from um, from our point of view, it's, uh, it's it really does inform the duty holder of their responsibilities. Uh, and the, and also the appointed person in most cases. Um, we were developing last year in my last uh, webinar the um, what's called the um, project managers asbestos awareness. This, uh, this course of one day duration and this would be to cover project managers who are appointing licensed and non-licensed contractors undertaking removal and remediation works. So this would obviously give the uh, delegate the skills to assess the licensed contractor, assess their plan of work and their RAMs, make sure they are competent. So again, in some of the questions we've received today, this would be more targeted if you are managing asbestos removal site works, this would be the course obviously to give you the knowledge to question the contractor's um, responsibility and question obviously the work uh, that they are undertaken. So that is it from us. Um, thank you very much um, for your time. Um, if you do have any further questions, then please send them through to Dimple and Dimple can, you can send them on to us and we'd be more than happy to type out the answers. It's just sometimes easier to do the, uh, the verbal answer as opposed to the written. Uh, for more information on UCATA, um, the details are at the bottom of the page there. So there's the website, there's the um, email address 